This is the Vespera 2, the second generation of smart telescope designed by Vionis. Vionis was the leader in smart telescope technology for about eight years before the release of more affordable options, such as the Seastar S50 and the Dwarf 3 smart telescope. Now, the big question is, a telescope at this price point, which I'll be talking about later in this video, does it still have a place in the market against those more affordable smart telescopes today? And what are its specifications? What really makes it unique? And what kind of image can an amateur astrophotographer who's just getting started in astrophotography expect to get with this device? Okay, so let's start off by talking a little bit about the specifications of this smart telescope. It has an aperture of 50 millimeters and a focal length of 250 millimeters. Now, we know that this is not unique at all in comparison to smart telescopes like the Seastar S50, which has the exact same specifications, but what really makes it unique is the sensor that's inside of it. The sensor used in this smart telescope is none other than the Sony IMX 5A5 sensor. So despite the fact that it has the exact same field of view and the exact same aperture as the Seastar S50, it has around four times the field of view as the Seastar S50 does, and it has a native image size of 8.3 megapixels. Of course, when you bring in the mosaic mode known as Koval ENS, uh, hopefully that's how you pronounce it, you can get a total image size of up to 24 megapixels. It has a built-in field flattener to make sure that you have perfect stars all around the field of view of the image. And the only downfall I've seen so far with this smart telescope is the fact that due to its top heavy design, it does not support equatorial mode, meaning that you can only take shorter exposures rather than 30 second to a minute exposures like you could with Dwarf 3 or the Sea Stars 50. If you are just getting started in astrophotography, the Vespera 2 is a great option for you if you don't know anything about post-processing. Post-processing can be a fairly difficult task to try to hurdle, but it has a built-in software that will automatically fix your images. It will sharpen your stars, increase the contrast, and make your astro images look so much more beautiful than they would just as a standard raw image. So that is a huge plus for me. The, the fact that those who are just getting started, they really don't have to worry about not knowing the basics because this will do it all for you. So we've talked a little bit about the specifications, but I haven't actually even powered it on or done a field test, which I think it's about time for now. Let's take it outside on a clear night and see what it's actually capable of. It is now nighttime, as you can see, and I'm very excited to see what the Vespera 2 is capable of. Let's get started by taking a look at our beautiful half moon. Okay, so autofocus is finally complete. What I'd like to see now is if it's actually capable of locating the moon or not. I know that the Sea Star always has issues trying to find it, even though it's like, it's so bright. It should be so easy to find, but for some reason it can never find it. So. Let's see if it's actually able to locate the moon or not. Let's try again to go to that. Observe. And it is going across. It says no sound because uh, my tablet does not have mobile data going to it, so it can't play the AI voice, which sounds like this. 21 million light years from Earth. With a diameter of about 170,000 light years, M101 is significantly larger than our own Milky Way and holds the distinction of featuring prominent spiral arms filled with young, hot stars, star-forming regions, and interstellar gas. Yeah, it's it's enough to put you to sleep. Just the sound is, his voice is so relaxing for some reason, and just listening about your favorite subject while you fall asleep is just absolutely ideal. Man, and it looks like we finally got it. Looks cool. And there it is, there's the moon. Has nice detail on it already, let's see. It is currently capturing the moon. I'm not really sure what that means. Perhaps it already started to do an auto stack on it. Uh, it 
it looks like it just has like it's like it looks like it's a video just really low frames per second it doesn't look like it's stacking or anything um, and it doesn't look like there's any way to record an AVI file or something like that which would be nice if they had to be able to get the most detail out of it I mean just this live view you can see a lot of the details in the craters and the surface of the moon but if we were to have a stacking function I'm sure we would get a lot more details than just this of course like I said it might already be stacking but I really cannot tell since there's not really a whole lot of information being shown at the bottom of the screen. So another nice feature here in the main menu uh, where you look for the deep sky objects is if you take a look at each one of these tiles, for those who are interested mainly uh, with the Vespera 2 for EAA, they have numbers on the top left hand side of each tile that show you the amount of time needed to get a fairly decent look at each one of these deep sky objects before you move on to the next one. For the sake of it, and just to test it out, let's go to a very well-known galaxy, M104, which is the Sombrero Galaxy. Let's take a look at that. Observe. And there it is, Sombrero Galaxy. I haven't actually tried capturing this particular galaxy before uh, I've seen some pictures of it online, but I haven't really paid too much attention to it, but it's a really cool looking deep sky object. So here is the image that we started off with. And after about two hours of exposure time, this is the image that we ended up with. And as you can see, there is a huge amount of noise reduction done with that extra amount of exposure time. And the Vesper 2 was able to clean up the image quite nicely. Now we're going to be doing a test with mosaic mode as well on the Milky Way Galaxy Core to see how well of an image that we can get with that and I will be displaying that here in just a second. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of this smart telescope now that we've tried it out a little bit. Uh, first of all, with the pros, one of the many things that I like about this smart telescope is just how well the mosaic function works on it. It works better than the sea star mosaic function and the dwarf lab mosaic function. They just managed to perfect this part of the software, uh, allowing for the mosaic to happen over a much quicker period of time rather than in a long extended process like it does with the sea star and the star shapes all remain perfect uh, in fact they even sharpen stars a little bit I've noticed a lot more image correction when using the mosaic mode uh, rather than using the standard imaging function so they did a great job with the mosaic mode the frame the field of view due to the larger sensor is a huge plus for if you're trying to image larger deep sky objects like the Orion Nebula Andromeda Galaxy unfortunately we are in the beginning of spring almost leading into summer and those deep sky objects are unfortunately not visible so we had to go with those smaller ones which are well known and popular deep sky objects but I really like the fact that this smart telescope is able to have that wide field of view and keep about the same amount of resolution as the C star S50 does uh, so you can zoom in and see more detail rather than zooming in and just seeing pixels blotched everywhere. I really like the AI companion. It's really knowledgeable. It explains a lot more what you're seeing and puts more depth into the experience of the electronically assisted astrophotography rather than just seeing what you see on the screen and not really knowing exactly what you're looking at. This AI companion really explains it all to you and helps you understand what you're looking at, how it was developed, who discovered it, and things like that. So it's a definitely a great educational tool for those who are trying to learn our night sky as well. But let's talk a little bit about the cons now. And unfortunately, I feel like the cons outweigh the pros on the smart telescope. Number one con for me is the price. It is priced at $1,690. Now, if you're planning on using the smart telescope only as an EAA telescope, you wanna jump from deep sky object to deep sky object and just continue on with that throughout your night, 
it is a great telescope for you. But if you're trying to really learn astrophotography, I can't really say that this is the best option because of the price. If you were to get a mount like Skywatcher DTI, a cheaper doublet refractor like the SV Boney 70 millimeter refractor and a deep sky camera like the ZWO ASI 585 or 533 MC Pro. Uh, then you can also get the ASI Air and get a better field of view, uh, much more zoomed in, detailed image than you can with this telescope. And it would really teach you more that you need to know. And using your money, say $1,690 to spend money on actual astrophotography equipment, like actual cameras, refractors, mounts, things like that. Even if you have to pay just a little bit more than that, I think that's a better option for you. But again, if you're just planning on using this telescope for EAA, hands down, this is one of the best options. Con number two is that I don't like that none of the filters are actually included unless you buy a certain bundle. The, the filters are priced a little bit too high for me in my opinion. Pretty much all the cons about the smart telescope have to do with the cost of the smart telescope. The cheaper options like the Dwarf 3 and the Seastar S50 they have about the same features, except they have the built-in filters. They can be used in equatorial mode, which is a huge plus if you plan on using a smart telescope to learn astrophotography, because you can. That's actually how I learned astrophotography, with a smart telescope. But unfortunately, with this telescope being at the price point that it's at, and the filters aren't included, and everything's just add-on, add-on, add-on price, you could use all that money, and again, just buy yourself a much better astrophotography rig if you're using it for astrophotography. The last thing that I didn't really like about this telescope is the fact that it can't be used in equatorial mode, so you're kind of stuck at what you can use it for. Uh, you can only use it for shorter imaging sessions rather than longer exposures like you can with the Dwarf 3. There could be things that I missed in this video, so if you have more experience with the Vespera 2, please make sure that you leave that in the comment section below so that others can learn a little bit more about the Vespera 2 than I was able to share here in this video. But I really appreciate everybody being able to uh, take the time to view this video. It helps to support my channel a lot. So again, thank you very much for watching. And I hope you all have a clear sky and a great night.